Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. And today, I'm very excited to go over another lesson on the secret doctrine. I had a recent episode on a lecture given by Manly P. Hall. Manly P. Hall studied secret societies and secret information and was very good author who wrote The Secret of the Ages and Occult America, which is written by Mitch Horowitz, talks about this. And uh, that last episode talks and kind of explained the secret doctrine, this bizarre thousand page book that explains the origins of the earth and man and is very similar to the law of one, but also has some weird oddities about it. So I found it very interesting, and so check that episode out. Manly P. Hall is an amazing writer who helps break some of this stuff down. I have acquired information like this from occult teachings, and some of it's impenetrable. Some of it's impossible to understand. Or it's, oh, okay, that sounds like a poem. But to have somebody that's a real genius at understanding the symbolic elements of this in Manly P. Hall explaining this stuff has been really eye-opening. I've always wanted to understand the secret doctrine in some old occult literature. Even if it's not true, I've wanted to understand it. I wanted to have that open source spirituality where I understand, okay, so this is what the secret doctrine says. Now, I briefly mentioned the book of Gion in the last episode and I did check on the pronunciation so that is correct pronunciation it's spelled D-Z-Y-A-N Manly P. Hall had a second lesson or lecture on the secret doctrine and it's a very interesting class because it focuses on the stanzas of Gion the stanzas of Gion are supposed to be a part of a book called the book of Gion which still is not available Um, Some say does not exist, but it's the old mysterious book and the story behind this book. So the stanzas supposedly are written by some other past race that's beyond us. Perhaps it's the Anunnaki or the Archaics or the any of the possible creators before us. Uh, There's a history to the universe that's written about in the secret doctrine. So there are some elements to this. It's an unfoldment in understanding in the history of the universe, or it's not. But there have always been questions. There's some of it that seems, is is there some of it that's possibly racist? And then it's not when you understand it's not even about races, but it uses certain terms. So I'm not entirely saying that it's not true, but it's very interesting. And some of this is so meditative and so deep and so powerful and interesting that I found it really interesting that the book of Gion is fascinating and some say it has the secrets to the universe in this mysterious book. And so we can unlock some of the book of Gion in the stanzas of Gion, which are part of the secret doctrine, but it's part of partially impossible to understand them until now. Now the book of Gion is a reputedly ancient text of Tibetan origin and the stanzas formed the basis for the secret doctrine, which was revealed in 1888, one of the foundational works of the Theosophical Movement by Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. Madame Blavatsky's claims regarding the Book of Gion uh, claimed to have been seen a manuscript of the Book of Gion while studying esoteric lore in Tibet, and she claimed this and other ancient manuscripts were safeguarded from profane eyes by the initiates of an occult brotherhood. The work had originally, according to Blavatsky, been written in the sacred language of Senzar. So there's this ancient book we've heard about, and she had read it, but did not, was able to remember portions of it. And she wrote, the first installment of the esoteric doctrines is based upon stanzas, which are the records of a people unknown to ethnology. It is claimed that they are written in a tongue absent from the nomenclature of languages and dialects with which philology is acquainted. They are said to emanate from a source repudiated by science. And finally, they are offered through an agency incessantly discredited before the world by all those who hate unwelcome truths or have some special hobby of their own to defend. 
Therefore, the rejection of these teachings may be expected and must be accepted beforehand. No one styling himself a scholar in whatever department of exact science will be permitted to regard these teachings seriously. Others have been skeptical. Max Mueller is reported to have said that in this matter she was either a remarkable forger or that she had made the most valuable gift to archaeological research in the Orient. In other references, Blavatsky claimed the Book of Xi'an belonged to a group of Tibetan esoteric writings known as the Books of Qute. And Blavatsky wrote, before a standard transcription of Tibetan into the Latin alphabet had been agreed upon, it took David Regal some time to establish that she was referring to what modern scholars write as our Gyadse, which is a section of the Tantras, parts of a voluminous Buddhist corpus commonly referred to as the Tantras. Other researchers have suggested a source in Chinese Taoism or Jewish Kabbalah. In Isis Unveiled, Blavatsky herself identifies Senzar as being ancient Sanskrit, as noted by John Algio in his book Blavatsky's other statements about Senzar, including a, the above lineage to Sanskrit, create a number of puzzles which make it difficult to take the etymological language family references literally since some link to Egyptian sources while yet others are still other roots. The stanzas of Xi'an in the works of other authors, and you'll see references in many places to the stanzas of Xi'an, supposed verses from the same stanzas of Xi'an were later published by Alice Bailey, another um, an interesting channeled work in a treatise on cosmic fire in 1925. Bailey claimed these verses had been dictated to her telepathically by the Tibetan master Zhuol Kul. And then ufologist uh, Desmond Leslie drew heavily on the stanzas of Xi'an in his writing and theorized they had originally been produced on the lost continent of Atlantis. If you've ever heard of Eric von Doniken, he claimed to have explored some of the book's content and its alleged history reporting unsourced rumors that the first version of the book predates Earth and that chosen people who simply touch the book will receive visions of what it describes. References to the stanzas exist in the fiction of H.P. Lovecraft, for example, in his short story The Haunter of the Dark, and have been expanded upon by other writers who have worked within the Cthulhu mythos. And of course, there's been criticism of the stanzas of Xi'an. When the secret doctrine appeared, William Emmett Coleman was outraged by Madame Blavatsky's pretensions of Oriental learning, undertook a complete exegesis of her works. He claimed that her main sources were H. H. Wilson's translations of the Vishnu Purana, Alexander Winchell's World Life, or Contemporary Geology, Ignatius Donnelly's Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, and other contemporary scientific and occult works plagiarized without credit and in his own opinion used in a blundering manner that showed superficial acquaintance with the subjects under discussion. And he further claimed that she took at least part of her stanzas of Jian from the hymn of creation in the old Sanskrit Rig Veda. Coleman promised a book that would expose all of her sources, including the word of Jian. Historian John, it, Ronald H. Fritz notes that Blavatsky claimed to have received her information during trances in which masters of Mahatmas of Tibet communicated with her and allowed her to read from the ancient book of Xi'an. The book of Xi'an was supposedly composed in Atlantis using the lost language of Senzar. But the difficulty is that no scholar of ancient languages in the 1880s or since has encountered the slightest passing reference to the Book of Xi'an or the Senzar language. And in her bi biography, HPB, The Extraordinary Life and Influence of Helena Blavatsky, Sylvia Cranston tackles the claim of plagiarism that was leveled. And her view, like Coleman, is that HPB plagiarism consisted of quoting primary sources without acknowledging the secondary sources from which they came. So ultimately, it's up for you to decide what this information means. But it's easier to understand if read with some cool music in the background. It's trippy. It's bizarre and unusual and weird. And I love that. It's cosmic. And there are two sections broken down.
And essentially what we're hearing is the first time I read this, it's just like a poem almost like I don't understand it. It's got a biblical nature feel to it, but the way that this is written is Manly P. Hall is presenting a class on the secret doctrine and he's going line by line of the stanzas of Gion that he's able to find and give his interpretation of what each means. And in so doing, the information that Manly P. Hall gives is mind-blowing. This is one of my favorite episodes and I'm so excited to read this. This is from a non-copyrighted work. You can find it at manlyphall.info. Uh, and any of his books and doctrines and documents are fascinating, and I recommend them. Manly B. Hall begins by saying, Believing that we show the greatest appreciation to those who labor with us and for us when we assist them to accomplish that work which they desire to do, we feel that we best serve our beloved teacher, Helena Petrovna, Blavatsky, when we carry to the greatest number of people the message which was her life work. Her monument among men is the labor which she accomplished for men, surrounded by selfish and misunderstanding persons who hindered her at every step. She gave to the world two great books, The Secret Doctrine and Isis unveiled. Through the pages of these, she taught the world those things which had been given to her as her great work and great responsibility. Today the disciples of Madame Blavatsky are not true either to her or the ideals which she sought to give them as they wrangled during her life. So they wrangle now that she is dead. They cast lots for her garments and spend entirely too much time deciding as to which among them is the holiest and entirely too little time studying, living, and promulgating the magnificent storehouse of wisdom which lies open to their hand. It is not the question of who does the work that is most important. It is the great question, is the work done? Hundreds of thousands of people need the light, which the secret doctrine is capable of giving them. Wisdom is not the property of any person for those things which man must have in order to survive, belong first and by right to man. The sin of omission is as great as the sin of commission, and every moment wasted in wrangle is a moment wasted to opportunity. Heavy and terrible is the debt which man incurs when he fails to do the work that is at his hands. All the world should read the stanzas of Gion. For they are the most remarkable history of life that is in existence. It is in the service of Madame Blavatsky that we have prepared this manuscript for you, offering with the stanzas a simple commentary, fragmentary, and incomplete, but possible a slight help in their understanding. The stanzas are taken verbatim from the secret doctrine as written by H. P. Blavatsky. She secured them while studying in Tibet. They are probably the oldest sacred book in the world and have been the property of the race since the dawn of time. We sincerely hope that you will gain benefit from them and learn to understand by a perusal of them some of the great mysteries of nature which are concealed therein. Nothing can speak as well for Madame Blavatsky as her own work, and in the presence of it let all remain silent. 
we have tried to secure copies of the stanzas in large enough number to meet our need and it is only because of the fact we have been unable to do so that we have mimeographed them for our students they accompany part two of our secret doctrine class this class is our simple way of expressing the respect and an admiration we feel for the woman and her work like the ancient wisdom itself we are presenting this class in a non-sectarian way for the good of those it may help all true students should be glad to have the work of this great mind given to as many as possible those who are not show spirit unworthy of consideration Manly P. Hall. Each of these contain the original stanzas as numbered. And then there's a commentary by Manly P. Hall. Cosmic Evolution. In seven stanzas translated from the book of Gion. Stanza 1. One, the eternal parent wrapped in her invisible robes had slumbered once again for seven eternities. The eternal parent is the absolute, the one cause of the endless diversity. Her ever invisible robes are space the ultimate extension of substance in every direction space is the substance from which all corporeal bodies are made it is the common denominator of all form this substance is gathered together periodically to serve as a vehicle for the manifestation of life when this life is withdrawn or ceases to directionalize its energies the form then returns again to its primitive essence space the seven eternities are periods of mental differentiation in order that students may comprehend the fact that as it requires seven so-called days to outbreathe a universe the law of periodicity requires that inhaling or drawing in of a universe to its abstract source is accomplished in seven hypothetical periods called here eternities of time two time was not for it lay asleep in the infinite bosom of duration as man's concept of time is merely a measurement of events based upon the periodicity of some natural function such as the motion of the Sun and is merely used as a method of establishing sequential relationship between incidents it cannot survive the destruction of its environment remove comparative things and you remove all standards which exist in the physical world Time is merely a concept of eternity created by a temporal condition. Remove the condition and you remove the products of it. 3. Universal mind was not, for there was no ah uh, high to contain it. When you remove manifestation, and return the manifesting elements to their bare state of existence you not only remove material function but you remove even consciousness itself therefore it is said the absolute knows itself only through its not self or reflection remove the mental world of nature and you remove thought remove the astral world of nature and you remove feeling remove the physical world of nature and you eliminate all bodies and forms the mind has a body 
as well as any other part of the system remove the mental body of the universal God and universal mind ceases to function remove the entire septenary chain of bodies and all manifestation ceases in nature except the one indestructible function of bare existence this does not mean that universal mind is dissolved the mind itself does not change in any way but for lack of a body it remains in abscondito present but without function in the same way you do not kill a man because you destroy his body but he vanishes from those environments with which the body was the link four the seven ways to bliss were not the great causes of misery were not for there was no one to produce and get ensnared by them the seven ways of bliss are the paths of attainment when there is nothing to attain there is no need of method the great causes of misery all of which are artificial and the result of inharmonious adjustment between things cease to function when there are no things to create these maladjustments therefore all the reaction of, of pain and pleasure cease when the friction of the striving atoms be they physical mental or spiritual no longer cause suffering or make use of methods to escape that suffering five darkness alone filled the boundless all for father mother and son were once more one and the son had not awakened yet for the new wheel and his pilgrimage thereon darkness is the natural condition it is light not manifesting all manifestation is artificial the eternal darkness is real the father mother and son are the three spirits that are the cause of the three great worlds of manifestation namely the spiritual the material and the intellectual the wheel is the universal chain revolving around its great central axis it is symbolic of the circle of creation upon which the gods walked during the days of manifestation and from which they retire when the night descends six the seven sublime lords and the seven truths had ceased to be and the universe the son of necessity was immersed in paranishpana to be outbreathed by that which is and yet is not not was the seven sublime lords in this solar system are the spirits of the planets and the seven truths are the seven great lights to which they bear witness the sun of necessity is the physical material universe created so that you and i and other living creatures might gradually unfold into dynamic powers the latent qualities which can only be fully developed under such environments as those with which we labor it is said that all this visible universe had ceased to be it was absorbed into the great deep there to remain until the immutable laws of nature ordered it to come forth again and wonder through that great period of time which we call existence seven the causes of existence had been done away with the visible that was and the invisible that is rested in eternal non-being the one being the causes of existence are the centers of spiritual force which descend from the ark as in the story of noah at the end 
of a day of manifestation, these lives are withdrawn into that veil which lies above the world of men. When these centers of powers are withdrawn, the atoms which compose the bodies through which those lives function, no longer having a central cohesive power, disintegrated or separated and returned to their basic formations. The effect being that worlds and stars vanished gradually in space. At a certain time, even the great above, or the inner universe, as it is called, also dissolves, and everything rests or exists in its most primitive state. Consciousness in sleep regaining its lost position as part of the functioning body of the Absolute, and form reabsorbed into space, which is the negative pole of the all-pervading consciousness. 8. Alone, the one form of existence stretched the boundless, infinite, causeless, and dreamless sleep and life pulsated unconscious in universal space throughout that all presence which is sensed by the opened eye of the Dangma. The Absolute in its abstract sense and space in its abstract sense are absorbed into each other becoming the one form of existence. The endless ebb and flow of infinite being was the one and only manifestation of life. Universal space enfolded the sleeping multitudes that had but a short time before lived and moved in temporary formations composed of these infinite ingredients. The all-seeing eye of the Absolute the unmeasurable and the unformed, I being merely in this case a symbolic figure of speech used to express the infinite sense of itself, which the all-pervading manifested in the night of the gods, is called the opened eye of Dangma. 9. But where was the Dangma when the Alaya of the universe was in Paramartha, and the great wheel was Anupadaka. This is in the form of a question, for it asks where the Eternal was when his body was absorbed in space, when his universe was without form, and the great circle of his manifestation was resolved back again into the perfect homogeneity. The mystic would answer, he is unchanged, for when all things are removed, he remains. Men sleep, gods sleep, universes sleep, but in sleeping and in waking, he remains unchanged. Stanza 2 1. Where were the builders, the luminous sons of Manvateric Dawn? In the unknown darkness, in their Ahai Paranishpana, the producers of form from no form, the root of the world, the Devamatri, and Svabhavat rested in the bliss of non being. This is also a question, for it asks where the spirits of the dawn, the luminous creatures who build worlds and universes, and it answers. They are returned again to their formless bodies. They are asleep with the wheels upon which they work. The great intelligence who is the root of the worlds, the gods and goddesses, the planes of nature, the saints and sinners, have all returned again to the great sleep where they rest awaiting the voice of the builder to call them back to the labor of existing. Two. Where was silence? Were there ears to sense it? No, there was neither silence nor sound. 
not save ceaseless eternal breath which knows itself not all opposites are absorbed in the infinite in illustrating this the ancient Tibetans used sound and silence one of which cannot exist without the other they explain that all of these things have passed away and nothing remains except the great vibratory rate of the absolute itself which is called here the eternal breath which knows itself not for the absolute only knows himself when he sees his powers reflected from the surface of the not self three the hour had not yet struck the ray had not yet flashed into the germ the matri padma had not yet swollen the time predestined by the laws immutable for the reawaking of the worlds had not yet come the great spiritual spark which touches the slumbering germ had not yet impregnated the world seed the mother lotus growing in the waters of eternity had not yet opened its petals space had not yet felt the urge of the absolute to enter again the artificial state of becoming for her heart had not yet opened for the one ray to enter thence to fall as three into four into the lap of Maya space the great mother was not ready for the ray to enter three is symbolical of spirit four is symbolical of matter the ray had not as yet fallen or descended as the three into the four Maya is the world of illusion the substance from which the dream of creation is made five the seven sons were not yet born from the web of light darkness alone was father mother Svavabat, and Svavabat was in darkness the seven planetary lords or their celestial archetypes were not yet born from the twisting swirling nebula impregnated with the thousands of crisscrossing threads of light for the darkness was still androgynous parent containing within itself the man-child who was to redeem the world the spirit and its workers were in darkness and darkness was supreme six these two are the germ and the germ is one the universe was still concealed in the divine thought and the divine bosom the father and mother are the root of the world and the root is now one for until the creation of the worlds of form all things are one confusion is born of difference creation is the confusion of the atoms order is born of unity and in dissolution unity is established the universe was still concealed in the divine thought the absolute and the divine bosom which is space stanza three one the last vibration of the seventh eternity thrills through infinitude the mother swells expanding from within without like the bud of the lotus the end of the great rest comes the law of periodicity demands that the night of sleep shall give place to the day of waking the world spirit is to come into incarnation and assume one after another the world bodies the world granule swells like a seed in the ground expanding from the within outward we know that all growth takes place as an expansion evolution is really expansion outward over the area of the not self the eternal granule floating in the sea of space feels the thrill and hears the call of the thing that has been done before and following the habit of eternity begins the process of creating a world two the vibration sweeps along 
touching with its swift wing the whole universe and the germ that dwelleth in darkness the darkness that breathes ever the slumbering waters of life creation according to the occult theory is not spontaneous or miraculous but is rather periodic taking place thousands of times so that the birth of a world is merely one appearance of a chain of things that have been born and have died a million times and will be born and die a million times again the radiant spirit of the dawn of life sweeps over the sleeping granule and impregnates the surrounding area of space with its light and power the millions of tiny germs of life that have been sleeping feel the thrill of the spiritual ray and awaking from their unconsciousness begin the process of re-establishing the cosmos three darkness radiates light and light drops one solitary ray into the mother deep the ray shoots through the virgin egg the ray causes the eternal egg to thrill and drop the non-eternal germ which condenses into the world egg the light is born out of the darkness for the darkness is the absolute and the light is the sun of the absolute that bears witness unto its father before all men and all worlds the mother is space the world virgin and the sons of god the rays of light move space as is said in the book of genesis where it states and the spirits of god moved the face of the waters this is the occult interpretation which alone brings order out of chaos in the old jewish cosmogony myths this ray of light striking the life germ causes it to open as in the case of the seed of any planet and from the eternal germ which is permanent descends the non-eternal germ which is impermanent this germ descends into space which is the world substance and there begins the process of building the world egg which it makes by impregnating and fructifying the granules of space four then the three fall into the four the radiant essence becomes seven inside seven outside the luminous egg which in itself is three curdles and spreads in milk white curds throughout the depths of mother the root that grows in the depths of the ocean of life the three germs which represent the eternal life principle of the world intelligence descend into the four which is the body of space vitalized and empowered by its spiritual origin the germ radiates life and light and its radiations become the worlds it becomes seven planes from the surface outward and seven bodies from the surface inward the luminous egg germ is called three for it contains the world spirit the world soul and the world body it curdles the surface of space for in moving the deep it begins the process of forming the physical bodies such as we see here but first they are gassy and nebulous these curds spread through that area of space which is set aside for this particular scheme of manifestation later these curds become bodies of the planets the atmosphere and all the manifesting elements of the sidereal universe five the root remains the light remains the curds remain and still oeahu is one in the next verse it explains that while all of these differentiations 
are taking place the compound Lord whose name is made up of many sounds O Ao Hu O Ao Hu remains one he is not divided differentiation is taking place within him he is neither greater nor lesser as the result of it 6 the root of life was in every drop of the ocean of immortality and the ocean was radiant light which was fire and heat and motion darkness vanished and was no more it disappeared in its own essence the body of fire or and water or father and mother the impregnating germ had sent its rays into the many worlds and its rays were gathering a universe together it had turned the darkness of rest into the flame of unrest and friction and the eternal darkness had become fire heat and motion which is interpreted to mean that it had become spirit soul and body darkness had been absorbed by the light for light and darkness are one substance the spirit is fire and the soul is heat and the body is motion the fire above was the great father the water and darkness below was the great mother these two had united and given birth to the child creation seven behold O Lanu, the radiant child of the two, the unparalleled refulgent glory, bright space, sun of dark space, which emerges from the depths of the great dark waters. It is Oahu, the younger. He shines forth as the sun. He is the blazing divine dragon of wisdom. The one is four and four takes to itself three and the union produces the sapta in whom are the seven which become the tridasa or the hosts and the multitudes behold him lifting the veil and unfurling it from east to west he shuts out the above and leaves the below to be seen as the great illusion he marks the places for the shining ones and turns the upper into a shoreless sea of fire and the one manifested into the great waters here it says behold O student the radiant child the universe born out of the invisible father and mother he is called bright space or nebula son of the dark space the great void he emerges from the deep waters of uncreation he is Oahu, the younger, the yet lesser universe made in the image of the greater. The blazing dragon, in this case, is the swirling fire mist. Out of the one comes the multitudes by the uniting of spirit and substance in its various combinations. The veil which is lifted is separateness, for crystallization gradually separates the above from the below. The above becomes the great reality for it is the spiritual world while the below or nature is the great shadow the sea of fire is the glory and radiance of the invisible planes while the great waters are the forms through which the fire manifests for as the alchemists have well taught man is a fire burning in the waters eight where was the germ and where was now darkness where was the spirit of the flame that burns in the lamp o lanu the germ is that and that is light the white brilliant sun of the dark hidden father the question is here asked as to what has become of the germ and the darkness and the student is asked where the spirit is which manifests as the flame burning in his lamp the student is expected to understand that the germ and the spirit are unchanged that the germ is everywhere and that the spirit is everywhere the germ is as it always was 
but the glory of its manifestations had destroyed the light, for the germ is the cause of the light. The spirit is the cause of the flame, for all life, all consciousness, and all manifestation bear witness to the invisible spiritual thing which gave birth to it. 9. Light is cold flame, and flame is fire, and fire produces heat, which yields water, the water of life in the Great Mother. In this verse, some information is given concerning the universe and its formation. Based upon the ancient occult chemistry, fire is invisible. It is neither hot nor cold, light or dark. Light bears witness of it. Flame bears witness of it. Heat bears witness of it. It is the sum of all these, and yet none of them. Heat striking the cold darkness of chaos produces moisture or humidity. And from this humidity by crystallization is created the earth. And the earth as veils, the humidity remains. That part which does not crystallize entirely becoming the atmosphere. 10. Father, mother, spin a web whose upper end is fastened to spirit. The light of the one darkness and the lower one to its shadowy end, matter. And this web is the universe spun out of the two substances made in one, which is Svabhavat. Spirit and substance, as father and mother, spin a web, create a body. One end of it is attached to the spirit. We call it in the consciousness and the higher mind. The other end is fastened to the shadow world, the substance. We call it the animal world and dense physical chemical matter. It is said that this web is the universe and composed of one substance that has placed itself against itself and become two. And as the spark that exists between the positive and the negative pole of the electric circuit, so manifestation is a spark born in space between the shining father, the positive pole, and the dark mother, the negative pole. 11. It expands when the breath of fire is upon it. It contracts when the f breath of the mother touches it. Then the sons dissociate and scatter to return into their mother's bosom at the end of the great day and re-become one with her. When it is cooling, it becomes radiant and the sons expand and contract. Through their own selves and hearts, they embrace infinitude. This substance expands or radiates when the great light is turned upon it. For it absorbs this light into itself and then pours it out from the center over its area. It contracts and crystallizes, becoming death-like when the cold darkness, referred to as the Great Mother, envelopes it. It then states that the luminous suns, the great lights, who up to this time have been in conscious unity, dissociate and scatter. By this, it is meant that they enter into the form world or the great illusion. When they have done this, they cease to recognize each other and to realize the cause world from which they came. They enter the concept of separateness, where they must remain until the dissolving of the universe at the end of the day of manifestation returns them again to the great all by liberating them from the sheaths of substance. The spirits then begin to mold the creation passing the radiant light mist through their own bodies in the form of the great figure eight, which is the symbol of regeneration. They then become the planetary bodies who do in a smaller way what the great light accomplished first. They embrace the infinitude and send infinitude into the darkness by impressing the atoms with the consciousness of the finite. 12. Then, 
Svab Bavat, sends Fohat to harden the atoms. Each is a part of the web, reflecting the self-existent Lord like a mirror. Each becomes, in turn, a world. Then the Lord of the entire scheme, the concrete expression of the Absolute, Svabhavat, sends Fohat, the Lord of Form, to crystallize the atoms. He is the third Logos, or rather, a manifestation of the third Logos. Each of these groups of atoms reflect the self-existent Lord, Svabhavat, and as they crystallize to form the world, each of them crystallizes into the image of their Creator. So are planets, men and gods made, each in a different proportion, but all according to one law. Stanza 4 1. Listen, ye sons of the earth, to your instructors, the sons of the fire, learn there is neither first nor last, but all is one, number issued from no number. The sons of the earth are those who reach mental individualization during the present earth change, while the sons of the fire reached their individualization in the mental world. They are the superior illuminating qualities and powers who express themselves in man through sense and mind centers within his own bodies. The statement that there is neither first nor last is used to remind the student that everything in the universe is an embodiment of the abstract, incomprehensible absolute, and in eternity all things are equal while in time, differentiation has established the system of relative comparisons greater and lesser, larger and smaller. All similar standards of comparison exist only in those places of nature where matter, in one of its many forms, has obscured the consciousness and rendered the ego incapable of self-analysis. All things come from nothing and had nothing they in return, for the occultist nothing is the sum of all things. 2. Learn what we who descend from the primordial seven, we who are born from the primordial flame, have learned from our fathers. Wisdom is not evolved within any part of creation as we know it. It descends from the unknown causal worlds. The gods learned it from their fathers, and men learn it from the gods. Wisdom is part of the consciousness of the primordial one, who brings it with him out of no thing. Wisdom, like life itself, is without beginning and without end. When men unfold their minds, they become philosophers, for wisdom is incarnated into the mental environment prepared to receive it. The minds come and go. But wisdom is permanent, unmoved. The power to think is ever-present. Thought is ever-present. But only those who have evolved their mental organisms to a certain degree are capable of receiving the impulses from the ever-existing thought world. 3. The effulgency of light, the ray of the ever-darkness, sprung in space the reawakened energies, the one from the egg, the six, and the five, then the three, the one, the four, the one, the five, the twice, seven the sum total, and these are the essence, the flames, the elements, the builders, the numbers, the arupa, the rupa, and the force of the divine man, the sum total, and from the divine man emanated the forms, the sparks, the sacred animals and the messengers of the sacred fathers within the Holy Four. Manley Hall explains that as the universe begins its descent downward into the form worlds, it assumes ever denser and more crystallized bodies. It awakens in its passage downward, or as occultists say, outward hierarchy of hierarchy of celestial beings who have remained unconscious and insensible but ever present until nature formed environments for their manifestation. 
At last, it reaches that, that stage of crystallization which we know as the visible universe. In the environment thus formed are evolving a multitude of creatures who remained out of manifestation until they were awakened by the new world formed to receive them. In this way the created worlds, which first existed as thought forms in space, peopled with hierarchies of mind-born suns, became dense chemical globes inhabited by spirits functioning through dense physical bodies. As the animals poured from the ark when the waters subsided, so the great shadow world physical universe was peopled with creatures who while themselves sons of the reality descended into the illusion, assumed bodies formed of the illusion, and animated these bodies within and without their own consciousness. These messengers are the individualized manifestation of the Holy Four, namely the unformed Lord Himself and His three witnesses, these sacred sparks born out of the great reality have become the multitude of lives evolving around us. They were formless and belonged to the Arupa worlds, but they have become creatures of form. These Rupa bodies have gradually been molded by their environments. At the present time, these bodies are those most suitable for the growth and unfoldment of the divine germ imprisoned within their atoms. 4. This was the army of the voice, the divine mother of the seven. The sparks of the seven are subject to and the servants of the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh of the seven. These sparks are called spheres, triangles, cubes, lines, and modelers, for thus stands the eternal Nidana, the Oahu, which is the servants of the third Logos are called the army of the voice. The first Logos is the eye of the infinite. The nostrils are symbolic of the second Logos, while the mouth is the third Logos. From this mouth comes forth the army of the voice, the vowel sounds formed by the great mouth of the sacred seven. The voice speaks forth its army, and the rates of vibration surge through infinity. The sparks and atoms dance and thrill in space, animated and vivified by the sacred seven, which as sounds issues from the divine mouth. The spheres, triangles, cubes, and lines spoken of refer to the atoms of which the seven worlds are composed. The base substance of each of the great world planes is composed of geometrically shaped granules. These differ in shape according to the plane to which they belong. The army of the voice under the control of the seven great lords molds these geometric granules into the orderly strata to be later used as bodies for the world spirit coming into incarnation. Nidana is the thread of life which fastens the universe together. It is the invisible thread of life along which crystallization takes place. 5. Darkness, the boundless or the no number, Adinadana Svabhavat. 1. The Adisanat, the number for he is one. Two, the voice of the Lord Svabhavat, the numbers for he is one and nine. And three, the formless square. And these three enclosed with the O are the sacred four. And the ten are the Arupa universe. Then come the sons, the seven fighters, the one, the eight left out, and the breath, which is the light maker. Some of the stuff doesn't make sense, just stick with it. The three great steps are established first the Adi Sanat, the one who is called the Old and the Elder, then the voice of the numbers, which is known as the desire to be, and is the function of the second Logos, and lastly the formless square, which is the material universe in its rupa or archetypal condition. These three Logi, within the body of the One, make the Four. They are the divine formless ones. In the second world dwells the Decimo, 
while from the mouth of the third world come forth the seven fighters, to whom is given the labor of organizing the inferior worlds, that they may become suitable bodies for the Lord, blessed be he. These seven, and the one who refused to come forth, or more correctly, the one who was left out, are also the great spiritual beings who form the suns of the cosmic chain. Our own sun, who makes the light with his breath, is the eighth left out in the sense that he was the first cast off from the dark swirling mass from which our manifold universe was produced. Then the second sun, or the Lepika, produced by the three. The rejected sun is one. The sun suns are countless. I have no idea what that means, but he explains the second seven are the lords of karma who record and note the destiny of the universe. They are the historians of cosmos and are in one sense of the word the seven planes of nature which record in their subtle substances the actions and reactions of all created things. As an example of this, we may say that our thoughts are recorded in the mental world, our feelings in the astral world, and our actions in the granules of physical substance. The rejected one became the center of our solar system and is the only great illumined presence which descended low enough to be sensed by the chemical elements and bodies. Stanza 5 1. The primordial seven, the first seven breaths of the dragon of wisdom, produce in their turn from their holy circumgyrating breaths the fiery whirlwind. The seven breaths poured out from the mouth of the third logos create the first principle of friction. The third logos is the one here referred to as the dragon of wisdom. The seven spirits before his throne by their strivings create Fohat, the fiery whirlwind. It is a mistake to say that Fohat is electricity, but he is certainly the thread of vitality running through all the universe. It is said in the ancient writings that the worlds are not upon the cord of Fohat. In one sense of the word, they are plexi. Electricity is one of the manifestations of Fohat. The gods make Fohat the messenger of their will, and he goes forth. 2. They make of him the messenger of their will. The Jiu become Fohat, the swift son of the divine sons, whose sons are the Lipica, runs circular errands. Fohat is the steed, and thought is the rider. He passes like lightning through the fiery clouds, takes three and five and seven strides through the seven regions above and seven below. He lifts his voice and calls the innumerable sparks and joins them. The great latent wisdom, which is called Zhu, becomes active and operative through the medium of Fohat in the same way that thought becomes activity through the medium of the nerves. Fohat, the universal nerve fluid, is called the steed or vahan, and thought or intelligence becomes the rider. Fohat passes, in the form of nerve impulses, through the fiery mass of the world to be. In this way, the gods gain control of the atoms, for they can later send their orders along the threads of force spun by Fohat. He passes with three, five, and seven strides through the worlds and cosmic planes, which constitute the three worlds, for the three, five, and seven of Freemasonry are the same as those referred to in this ancient Tibetan book. His voice is his activity. He calls the sparks from the primordial substance, and they gather round his threads of activity. An endless droning sound like the purr of a great engine is heard. It is Fohat born of the friction of space. 3. He is their guiding spirit and leader. When he commences work, he separates the sparks of the lower kingdom that float and thrill with joy in their radiant dwellings and forms therewith the germs of wheels. He places them in the six directions of space and one in the middle. The central wheel. Fohat is the power that rules the sparks as the nerves rule the organs of the body. He separates the denser particles 
that dwell in the darkness below, and forms of them nerve plexi or seed atoms which later become planets. He places them in the six directions in the form of interlaced triangle, and in the center he places the seventh, and the seventh is one of the great seven, so the body of the universe is ordained. 4. Fohat traces spiritual lines to unite the sixth to the seventh. The crown and army of the sons of light stand at each angle, and the lupica in the middle wheel. They say, this is good, and the first divine world is ready. The first is now the second. Then the divine arupa collects itself in chaya loka, the first garment of the anupadaka. As all parts of the body are connected with the brain, so the lords of the six angles are connected with the spiral threads to the crown who dwells in the center. The builders, who are called the sons of light, take their places upon the six great atoms, while the ruling hierarchy dwells in the center, thus the abstract body of the Logos is made. This body is invisible and intangible to such sense as we now possess but was nevertheless far denser than its preceding state. Condensation has begun in space, and the formless Lord assumed his first body and began the process of being enmeshed in the great illusion of creation. Fohat takes five strides and builds a winged wheel at each corner of the square for the four holy ones and their armies. The process of descending into the denser substances continues. Fohat builds the four great thrones or centers for the Maharajas of the four angles. They are the lords and kings of the Dian Choans and rulers of the four cardinal angles of cosmos. There are the beasts of revelation who bow before the throne of the infinite. The Rosicrucians called them the lords of form. They are the lion, the bull, the man, and the eagle. They are the four great body centers in man. They are also the winged wheels filled with eyes referred to in Ezekiel 6. The Lapika circumscribed the triangle. The first one, the cube, the second one, and the pentacle within the egg. It is the ring called pass not for those who descend and ascend. Also, for those who, during the Kalpa, are progressing towards the great day, be with us. Thus were formed the Rupa and the Arupa, from one light, seven lights, from each of the seven, seven times seven lights. The wheels watch the ring. The Lapikas begin the process of organizing. They also separate the permanent from the impermanent, giving to each its appointed place. They build the ring past knot, which is to separate cause and effect. This ring also is the outer boundary of cosmos and separates the gleaming, glistening bubble from the dark space that surrounds it. It can be called the invisible shell, which nothing can pass through until the great day be with us. Each of the primitive seven great lights casts off seven suns, each of these casts off seven planets. Each of these planets differentiates seven globes within their bodies, and the globes and the wheels face the ring, prepared to follow the orders of the central light, which is their cause and ultimate. Stanza 6. 1. By the power of the Mother of Mercy and Knowledge, Quan Yin, the triple of the Quan Sha Yin, residing in Quan Yin Tian, Fohat, the breath of their progeny, the son of the sons, having called forth from the lower abyss the elusive form of Xian Tahang and the seven elements. Hall explains by means of the invisible, concealed mother of nature, Quan Yin and the material body of nature, her consort and Fohat, the child of their frictions, the shadow of the material universe, was called forth out of the lower abyss, and the seven material elements appeared as crystallizations of their spiritual causes. The previous stages discussed were invisible, and while they dealt with substances, these substances were too fine and attenuated 
to be cognized by such senses as we possess today. The subtle elements of nature were moved long before the dense physical particles could be made to respond. 2. The swift and radiant one produces the seven Laya centers, against which none will prevail to the great day, be with us, and seats the universe on these eternal foundations surrounding Sien Tehan with the elementary germs. The seven Laya centers were formed by Fohat as the germs of the coming planets. They were vortices, low pressure areas, which ever moving, spinning, and twisting later gathered the worlds about them, veiling themselves in planets and other celestial bodies. Nothing will prevail against these centers until the great day of dissolution. The physical universe is built around these germs, which are its true foundation. Each of these series of wheels consisted of seven large wheels, each with its seven smaller globes within itself. Thus forms were established. 3. Of the seven, first one manifested, six concealed, two manifested, five concealed, three manifested, four concealed, four produced, three hidden, four and one. Tsan revealed two and a half concealed, six to be manifested, one laid aside, lastly seven small wheels revolving, one giving birth to the other. That's the reason why I have such a hard time reading The Secret Doctrine, is there's a bunch of sentences like that, and that's why I had given up, and why I appreciate Manley Hall's contribution. Hall explains this means gradually these wheels unfolded, and the spirit of the globe took up its dwelling in them, one after the other, by means of these seven stages that are called the days of creation. The spirit of the globes gradually passed from its invisible source to its invisible ultimate. Each of these globes was born out of the preceding one and becoming the parent of the next. The hosts of lives evolving through and upon these globes passed from one to another in their endless search for the promised land. 4. He builds them in the likeness of older wheels, placing them on the imperishable centers. How does Fohat build them? He collects the fiery dust. He makes balls of fire, runs through them and round them, infusing life therein too, then sets them into motion, some one way, some the other way. They are cold, he makes them hot. They are dry, he makes them moist. They shine, he fans and cools them. Thus acts Fohat from one twilight to the other, during seven eternities. Hall explains, Fohat, the voice of the progeny, built these wheels in the likeness of the great wheel, and according to the plan that had been established aeons before, the imperishable center he used as the axis or thread, and upon these centers he strung the wheels or beads. They were capable of being destroyed, but the thread was imperishable. Fohat gathered the flaming sparks of space. He made balls of fire, nebula. He ran through them, impregnating them with his energy. He gave them his power, which is motion. They turned in different directions according to the work they had to accomplish. They were cold and dark, the mental air mist. He made them hot, the astral fire mist. He made them moist, humid, water, ether. He cooled them into solids chemical dense substances, thus acts the spirit of Fohat, the lord of change, from the dawn of creation till the twilight, his labors taking seven eternities. 5. At the fourth, the sons are told to create their images. One third refuses to obey. The curse is pronounced. They will be born on the fourth, suffer and cause suffering. This is the first war. Hall explains the fourth round of every chain is the greatest density, and at that time the sparks individualized from the body of the Logos must assume their fourth rate of consciousness. In the case of our chain of globes, the fourth round was beginning of human life, as we know it today. Some of the spiritual globes of light, which we call spirits, refused to come in, and upon them was pronounced a curse. The curse 
was the reaction of the law upon those who refused to obey it. They became the red men who were born in the fourth race which we know as the Atlanteans and were the most warlike and destructive of all nations. 6. The older wheel rotated downwards and upwards. The mother's spawn filled the hole. There were battles fought between the creators and the destroyers, and battles fought for space. The seed appearing and reappearing continuously. Hall claims the older wheels referred to are the first three globes of our own earth chain upon which man passed through the mineral, plant, and animal stages of his growth. The mother's spawn are the world germs. They battled in space for a right to exist. Many were destroyed. But finally, the stronger gathered themselves into comets and became the wanderers. These comets later became suns and planets. In embryology, we can see one of the most remarkable examples of primitive life and its battle for existence. In this microscopic war, many lives are lost. Rather, it would be better to say many little creatures lose the opportunity to live in order that one may survive. 7. Make thy calculations, Lanu, if thou wouldst learn the correct age of thy small wheel. Its fourth spoke is our mother. Reach the fourth fruit of the fourth path, of the knowledge that leads to a nirvana, and thou shalt comprehend, for thou shalt see. The great ones have explained to us that our system of worlds is made up of seven wheels. Each of these wheels is spinning on one of the major spokes which are the seven born out of the one. The fourth spoke is the parent of our globe for we are on the fourth of the lesser wheels. We are in the fifth division of the fourth wheel for our present race is the fifth division of the human world period. And the human world period is by the fourth spoke of the great wheel composed of seven world periods. It is by this rather abstract method of calculation that man is able to determine his true position in the great plan. Stanza 7 1. Behold the beginning of sentient formless life. First, the divine, the one of the mother spirit then the spiritual, the three from the one, the four from the one, and the five, from which the three, the five, and the seven, these are the threefold, the fourfold downward, the mind-born sons of the first Lord, the shining of the seven. It is they who are thou, me, him, O Lanu, they who watch over thee and thy mother earth. Paul states that in this verse the origin of sentient life is discussed. The system is exactly the same on a smaller scale that the great cosmic system passed through in a greater way. The solar logos is called Ishvari, and he is referred to here as the first lord. His mind-born sons are the seven planetary lords created out of himself. Bumi, the great mother, is in this case the earth itself. The mother spirit is the divine overconsciousness from which the logi and regents are differentiated. The three from the one are the three witnesses who will sow the seeds of spirit, soul, and body into the solar world. The Lanu is told that these spiritual practices are within himself. They are his life. They exist separate from him, but he cannot exist separate from them. 2. The one ray multiplies the smaller rays. Life precedes form and life survives the last atom of form. Through the countless rays proceeds the life ray, the one like a thread through many jewels. Paul writes, the one light of the solar logos breaks up into many parts. These parts become the differentiated portions of the solar system. For every atom and granule of the solar space is impregnated 
with the consciousness and power of Ishvari. His life courses through everything, like the thread upon which beads are strung. 3. When the one becomes two, the threefold appears, and the three are one. And it is our thread, O Lanu, the heart of the man plant called Saptaparna. Saptaparna, Hall says, is a sacred plant, the seven leaves of which are said to represent the sevenfold constitution of man. The one consciousness becomes the two, sense, and they become the three, activity, and the three are one, and that one is a triple thread, and that thread is the basis of the growth of the triune constitution of man. 4. It is the root that never dies, the three-tongued flame for the four wicks. The wicks are the sparks that draw from the three-tongued flame shot out by the seven, their flame, the beams, and the sparks of one moon reflected in the running waves of all the rivers of earth. Hall says this thread is called the root that never dies. The three-tongued flame called Atma Buri Manas bears witness to the three divinities and blazes forth from the interior constitution of all things. This is the true three-headed God. The sparks are the human monads, but in reality as used here, the term means all the germs of life evolving in the solar system. The moon is the last incarnation of the earth spirit and still has charge over the building of physical bodies. 5. The spark hangs from the flame by the finest thread of Fohat. It journeys through the seven worlds of Maya. It stops in the first and is a metal and a stone. It passes in the second and behold a plant. The plant whirls through seven changes and becomes a sacred animal. From the combined attributes of these Manu the thinker is formed. Who forms him? The seven lives in the one life. Who completes him? The fivefold law. And who perfects the last body, fish, sin, and soma? Hall writes, The spirit hangs by a spiral thread from the flame which is its source, this flame being the solar logos. United to its source by a tiny thread, it wanders through the seven worlds, which form the body of the material universe. In the first globe, it was mineral. In the second globe, it was a plant. In the third globe, it became a sacred animal. The fruitage of all this previous work combined together with the addition of Manu, the thinker, resulted in the individualization of the human kingdom. The seven superior rays of force formed him. The lords of mind completed him, and fish, sin, and soma will complete the process of enfolding him. The fish is symbolic of the earth swimming in the waters of space. Sin is the symbol of the soul which is built by the reactions of evil deeds, while Soma, an intoxicating liquor, represents the spirit, for the power to ferment is a divine attribute. 6. From the firstborn, the thread between the silent watcher and his shadow becomes more strong and radiant with every change. The morning sunlight has changed into noonday glory. The silent watcher is the spirit of man, Paul says, that never really enters into the bodies at all, but sends a ray of itself into the form. This ray is connected by a shadowy thread with the true consciousness itself. The shadow referred to is the chain of bodies which bear but imperfect resemblances to the life itself. The dawn of creation has given place to the noonday accomplishment. 7. This is the present wheel, said the flame to the spark. Thou art myself to my image and my shadow. I have clothed myself in thee, and thou art my vahan to the day. Be with us when thou shalt re-become myself, and others thyself and me. Then the builders, having donned their first clothing, descend on radiant earth, and reign over men who are themselves. This is thy world. The flame is supposed to have said to the spark, I have clothed myself in thee. The flame, of course, is the Logos, 
the spark is the spirit individualized the logos has broken himself up and veiled himself in the bodies of the sparks where he must remain until the great day be with us the builders who don their first clothing with the great spiritual beatings who descended on the north polar cap of the earth and ruled over men these men themselves were great spiritual beings in disguise anthropogenesis stanzas from the book of Jean. from the anthropogenesis section stanza one one the law which turns the fourth is subservient to the law of the seven they who revolved during their chariots around the lord the one eye his breath gave life to the seven it gave life to the first the great spiritual being law hall says who rules our globe the fourth is a servant to the lord of the seven these seven drive the chariots of the planets around the shining eye of the sun who is the symbolical of the spiritual body of the logos the rays of the sun give life to the seven planets and from the sun came the life which animated the first globe of our world chain two said the earth lord of the shining face my house is empty send thy sons to people this wheel thou hast sent thy seven sons to the lord of wisdom seven times doth he see thee nearer to himself seven times more doth he feel thee Thou hast forbidden thy servants, the small rings to catch thy light and the heat, the great bounty to intercept on its passage. Send now to thy servant to the same. The Lord of the earth said to the son that his house was empty, Hall says. He asked that spirits might be sent to his wheel as they had been sent to others. He said the son had sent his seven children to the sphere of Mercury, and he felt that some should come to him. Three, said the Lord of the shining face, I shall send thee a fire. When thy work is commenced, raise thy voice to other locusts. Apply to thy father, the Lord of the lotus, for his sons. Thy people shall be under the rule of the fathers. Thy men shall be mortals. The men of the Lord of wisdom, not the lunar sons, are immortal. Cease thy complaints, the seven skins are yet on thee thou art not ready thy men are not ready hall says the lord of the sun answered him saying i will send thee life when thou art ready for it cease thy complaints for the lord of the lotus the moon shall send you sons thy sons shall be under the rule of the old ones the lords of the moon cease thy complaining thy seven worlds have not yet been formed thou art not ready to receive life for after great throes, she cast off her old three and put on her new seven skins and stood in her first one. So after passing through many strange cataclysms, the planet Earth prepared itself for the coming of life. The seven globes of her first chain were ready. Stanza 2. 5. The wheel whirled for the thirty crores more. It constructed rupas, soft stones, that hardened, hard plants that softened, visible from invisible insects and small lives. She shook them off her back whenever they overran the mother. After thirty crores, she turned around, she lay on her back and sighed. She would call no sons of heaven. She would ask no sons of wisdom. She created from her own bosom. She evolved watermen, terrible and bad. The planet, therefore, continued in its endless course for many millions of years, Hall says, explaining it began to build bodies. The gases gathered and gradually the mineral kingdom became ever more crystallized and the etheric stones became dense chemical rock. Therefore, it is said, there were soft stones that hardened. The hard plants that softened began as moss and semi-crystal things. As they evolved through the eternities, the life within them evolved. They softened, and from an almost mineral condition, they evolved their present supple bodies. Whenever the earth became overrun with any of these groups, great cataclysms destroyed them all. During the ages, the inclination of the polar axle changed many times, and as its angle is the key to the lives that evolve upon the planet, the lives changed with each new position of the axle. 
As in the story of the Scandinavian creation, the earth began to form creatures out of itself. But they were soulless, for the spirits of heaven had not entered into them. 6. The waterman terrible and bad she herself created from the remains of others, from the dross and slime of her first, second, and third. She formed them. The Diani came and looked. The Diani from the bright father mother from the white regions they came from the abodes of the immortal mortals the earth hall says became overrun with these creatures the substances they created from were the remains of the previous rounds or periods they were strange gaunt misshapen creatures supposedly covered with scales like fishes a host of great creatures came from the father which is the sun and the moon which is the mother. From the superior worlds they came and gazed upon the works of the earth. 7. Displeased, they were our flesh. Our flesh is not there, no fit rupas for our brothers of the fifth, no dwellings for their lives, pure waters, not turbid, they must drink, let us dry them. So these spirits were displeased, Hall says, for they found no bodies there for the spirits that were to come in. So they just tried to dis destroy them all. 8. The flames came, the fires with the sparks, the night fires, and the day fires. They dried out the turbid dark waters. With their heat they quenched them. The laws of the high, the lamayan of below, came. They slew the forms which were two and four-faced. They fought the goat men and the dog-headed men and the men with fishes' bodies. Paul says, a great host of spiritual beings called the flames, the servants of the sun and the servants of the moon came down like a cloud upon the earth, and they destroyed the false creatures and cleansed the earth, very similarly to the story related in the flood of Noah. 9. Mother Water, the great sea, wept. She arose, she disappeared in the moon which had lifted her, which had given her birth. The half ether, half water, which is called the mother waters, rose as a great cloud from earth unto the moon, which had given her birth. 10. When they were destroyed, mother earth remained here. She asked to be dried. So Hall says, when all these things had passed away, the earth remained a void. She asked to be crystallized into a more solid and compact mass in order that she might be the home of true living things and not false creatures of the mist. Stanza 3, 11, the Lord of Lords came. From her body he separated the waters, and that was heaven above, the first heaven. Paul says, the region appointed by the solar God, who is here called the Lord of Lords, now descended from the sun unto the planet. He molded the body of the earth. He divided the above from the below, creating the heavens and the earth as we know them now. 12, the great Johans called the lords of the moon of the airy bodies bring forth men men of your nature give them their forms within she will build coverings without males females will they be lord of the flame also plans were then made to bring forth nobler creatures in the image of the gods themselves the great lights were to form the spiritual centers of these bodies and the mother nature was to build coverings that these lives might manifest in substance. By this means were to be developed creatures who were to be great as gods themselves because the gods dwelt within them and were the source of their life. 13. They went each on his allotted land. Seven of them each on his lot. The lords of the flame remained behind. They would not go. They would not create. So Hall says, so each of these great group of lords went in to that type of bodies which had been prepared for him, all except the lords of the flame. They would not go in. They rebelled against the law that had built the bodies for them. Stanza 4. 14. The seven hosts, the will-born lords, propelled by the spirit of life-giving separate men from themselves, each on his own zone. So it, the seven hosts then gathered groups of the embryonic men together, 
differentiating them one group from another, placing each in his own zone. They accomplished this with the assistance of Fohat, who acted as messenger and vitalizer. 15. Seven times seven shadows of future men were born, each of his own color and kind, each inferior to his father. The fathers, the boneless, could give no life to beings with bones. Their progeny were Buta, with neither form nor mind, therefore they are called the Chaya. Many times the lords tried to build a body, but being themselves, without experience in physical substance, they could only build shadows. For they were without bones, could not build bones, and they were without minds, could not build minds. Therefore the race they gave birth to was a race of shadowy images, lacking many things which were necessary to their human manifestation. 16. How are the Manu Shia born? The Manus with their minds, how are they made? The fathers called to their help their own fire, which is the fire that burns in earth. The spirit of the earth called to his help the solar fire. These three produced in their joint efforts a good rupa. It could stand, walk, run recline or fly, yet it was still but a chaya, a shadow with no sense. The question is asked how the creatures with minds were born. In order to accomplish this, the lords who were building them and who had over, come over from the moon, Hall says, called the planetary fire, somewhat similar to electricity, to their assistance, they also called to the sun and asked him to lend his immortal light to become the consciousness of things. As a result of this, through the cooperation of all these elements, the archetype of man was made. The process took hundreds of millions of years. All this occurred before man or the planet itself had actually been differentiated from the sun. While its center had been established in space, it was still enveloped by the radiance of the Great Father. 17. The breath needed a form, the fathers gave it. The breath needed a gross body, the earth molded it. The breath needed the spirit of life. The solar loss breathed it into form. The breath needed a mirror of its body, we gave it our own, said the Dionys. The breath needed a vehicle of desires, it has it, said the drainer of waters. But breath needs a mind to embrace the universe. We cannot give that, said the fathers. I never had it, said the spirit of the earth. The form would be consumed were I to give it mine, said the great fire. Man remained an empty, senseless Buddha. Thus have the boneless given life to those who became men with bones in the third. Paul explains the human spark called the breath needed a form, so the lords of the moon gave it to the etheric double. It needed a physical body, so the earth molded it into the etheric double. The germ needed a life spirit, so the solar angels gave to it. The germ needed an astral body and a vehicle of desire, so the lords of the astral world and the drainer of waters, who is the spirit of passion, supplied one. All of that now needed was a mind, but the lords of the moon had none. The spirits of the earth had none. The great mind said, Mine is so great that if man should have it, it would destroy him. So even in the third race or the early Lemurian world, man wandered mindless over the prehistoric planet. Stanza 5 18. The first were the sons of Yoga, their sons, the children of the Yellow Father and the White Mother. Paul says, It is said that the first race were the self-born, while the second were the fruitage of a union between the spirits of the sun and the spirits of the moon. They have vanished forever from the surface of the nature, only the Akashic record to remember them. 19. The second race was the product by budding and expansion the asexual from the sexless. Thus was O Lanu, the second race produced. 
Hall explains that the second ray still indwelling in the spirit of the sun was globular in shape. It reproduced itself by budding and expanding and by a process of fission. It existed for many ages and was known as the Hyperborean species. In this species, the first principle of sex were manifesting, although the invisible form was sexless. 20. Their fathers were the self-born, the self-born, the Chaya, from the brilliant bodies of the lords, the fathers, the sons of twilight. They were the children of the self-born, they were shadows, from the brilliant bodies of the lords, their fathers, their fathers being the Petris, which issued from the dark body of Brahma. 21. When the race becomes old, the old waters mixed with the fresher waters, when its drops become turbid, they vanished and disappeared in the new stream. In the hot stream of life, the outer of the first became the inner of the second. The old wing became the new shadow in the shadow of the wing. Hall explains the first race outlived the period of its usefulness. The labor it had come to do was accomplished, and gradually it was absorbed into the second. The dark air born became the flaming light born, the subtle bodies which had been the exterior vehicles of the first race withdrew into the organism and their places were taken by newer and denser vehicles. Thus the external spiritual bodies of the first became the internal spiritual bodies of the second and so on. Stanza 6, 22. Then the second evolved the egg born, the third, the sweat grew, its drops grew, and the drops became hard and round. The sun warmed it, the moon cooled it, and shaped it. The wind fed it until its ripeness. The white swan from the starry vault overshadowed the big drop, the egg of the future race. The man swan of the later third, first male female, then man and woman. From the second was evolved the third race, the early Lemurian part of which was capable of re reproducing itself by fission, while another part came forth from eggs and were able to run and walk from the moment of birth, Hall says. During this period, the race actually assumed its present form. Also present during this period, the sexes were divided. 23. The self-born were the Chayas, the shadows from the bodies of the sons of the twilight. The earlier races could not be destroyed because their bodies were composed of high super physical elements. They were absorbed from one race into another and at certain periods great cataclysms caused by the gods annihilated them. But the Lemurian race having built true physical bodies were capable of being destroyed. Stanza 7, 24 The sons of wisdom, the sons of night, ready for rebirth, come down. They saw the vile forms of the first third. We can choose, said the lords, we have wisdom. Some entered the chaya, some projected the spark, some deferred till the fourth. From their own rupa they filled the karma. Those who entered became arhats. Those who received but a spark remained destitute of knowledge. The spark burned low. The third remained mindless. Their jivas were not ready. These were set apart among the seven. They became narrow-headed. The third were ready. In these shall we dwell, said the lords of the flame. At this time, the great spiritual lights again viewed the sons of men. They said, we can choose whether we shall enter these other forms or not. Some entered and became the great and wise arhats. Others said, We will wait until the fourth race. The seven dark lords chose their bodies, descending as they saw fit. You and I are more than merely forms. Our consciousness, Hall explains, is really part of that great group of celestial beings who at different periods in the history of man descended into the vessels of clay prepared for their coming. 25. How did the Manasa, the sons of wisdom, act? They rejected the self-born, they are not ready. They spurned the sweat-born, they are not quite ready. They would not enter the first egg-born. 
Hall explains this means the fruitage of the first planetary chain had waited long for bodies. They rejected the self-born as being unfit. They also turned away from the sweat-born, nor would they enter into the earlier egg-born. 26. When the sweat-born produced the egg-born, the twofold and the mighty, the powerful with bones, the lords of wisdom said, Now shall we create. When, however, the third race had assumed its human shape, Hall says, and had become of upright stature, the Lord said, Now we shall enter in. 27. The third race became the Vahana, of the lords of wisdom. It created sons of will and yoga by Kriyasatki. It created them, the holy fathers, ancestors of the Arhats. Paul explains, therefore, the third race furnished bodies to the lords of wisdom. The lords of wisdom, speaking through the third race, made it a great people, for they gave it wisdom, this wisdom being the knowledge of good and evil. Stanza 8. 28. From the drops of sweat, from the residue of the substance, matter from dead bodies of men and animals, of the wheel before, from the cast-off dust, the first animals were produced. The animal wave of life began in the second round where it assumed the material discarded by the men of the first round. From this, it produced its bodies, which were then composed also of its astral substance. 29. Animals with bones, dragons of the deep, and flying sarpas were added to the creeping things. They that creep on the ground got wings. They of the long necks in the water became progenitors of the fowls of the air. As man was a fantastic creature during his early stages of growth, Hall explains, so during the early developments of the animal's form ran riot. Great creatures existed. These were well known to science, but were absolutely unrecognized by any except initiates at the time when these sacred stanzas were written. 30. During the third race, the boneless animals grew and changed. They became animals with bones. Their chayas became solid. During the third round, the animals changed. They became creatures with bones, Hall says. Forms had they, and their shadows became solid. These shadows were molded according to the fantastic pattern of the superphysical worlds. Therefore, the dinosaur and other strange prehistoric creatures owe their shape to the invisible worlds which patterned it. 31. The animals separated the first. They began to breed. The twofold man separated also. He said, Let us as they, let us unite and make creatures, and they did. So the animals began to breathe, Hall says, and to produce their species, and men did likewise during the third period. 32. And those which had no spark took huge she animals unto them. They begat upon them dumb races, dumb. They were themselves, but their tongues untied. The tongues of their progeny remained still. Monsters they bred. A race of crooked red hair covered monsters going on all fours. A dumb race to keep the shame untold. Hall says from the invisible records of nature, we have the story of the interbreeding of men and beasts, which produced great races of unintelligent giants. But like all hybrid creatures, they did not continue, and history bears no record of them. It is possible that certain forms of apes bear some sort of record of this condition. Stanza 9, 33. Seeing which the laws, who had not built men, wept, saying, When the divine hierarchs, who had not descended into the world or become ensouled in the bodies of men, beheld this chaos upon the earth, they were very unhappy, for it was not according to the plan. 34. The Amanasa have defiled our future abodes. This is karma. Let us dwell in the others. Let us teach them better, lest worse should happen. They did. They said, These creatures without minds have defiled our future dwelling places. Let us not dwell in them. Let us dwell in others. Let us instruct them concerning their great sin, lest worse shall happen. 35. Then all men became endowed with manas. They saw the sin of the mindless. So, Hall says, Then the race received minds and beheld the sin of the mindless and realized what a great sin had been committed. 
36, the fourth race developed speech. Hall says the fourth race was the first one to use true speech because before that time they copied the sounds of nature, making known their feelings and desires by imitating the voice of the storms, the rustle of the wind through the trees, and other natural noises. Man developed the larynx after the division of the sexes, for as all scientists know, there is a direct connection between the throat and the generative system. 37. The one became two. Also, all the living and creeping things that were still one giant fish birds and serpents with shell heads, even after the sexes had been divided, there were still forms of life which remained androgynous. Stanza 10. 38. Thus, two by two on the seven zones, the third race gave birth to the fourth race of men. The gods became no gods. The shura became asura. The seven zones, Hall says, are the areas of the earth's surface which have been set aside for the development of the seven races. The third race gave birth to the fourth, the Atlantean. 39. The first on every zone was moon-colored, the second yellow like gold, the third red, the fourth brown which became black with sin. The first seven human shoots were all of one complexion, the next seven began mixing. Hmm. Hall explains the colors of the races are explained in this verse. It is the combining of these colors which is the base of all the differences existing in the world today. Of course, the first and second races have entirely vanished. 40. Then the fourth became tall with pride. We are the kings, it was said. We are the gods. The Lemurian and Atlantean races were of great size. They are the giants who walked upon the earth. From them has come the most legends concerning the gods who walked upon the earth. 41. They took wives fair to look upon, wives from the mindless, the narrow-headed. They bred monsters, wicked demons, male and female, also, Kado Dakini, with little minds. The Atlanteans took wives from among the Lumurians and also from some other races of the mindless. The result was monsters, wicked creatures of all kinds, and beings of little intelligence. 42. They built temples for the human body, male and female they worshipped. Then the third eye acted no longer. They are the ones, the Atlanteans, who began the process of building temples after the pattern of the human body. It is also during their day that phallic worship was supreme. When the extreme materiality began to be felt and man built senses connected him with the objective worlds, he gradually lost contact with his invisible progenitors. Therefore, it is said the third eye closed. Stanza 11, 43. They built huge cities of rare earths and built metals, and they built and out of fires vomited out of the white stone of the mountains, out of the black stone. They cut their own images in their size and likeness and worshipped them. Hall says the late Lemurians built great cities and also began the process of tempering metals. They also began to cut images of heroes and gods and worship them. Here and there, even to this day, are to be seen relics of the Lemurian days. Many of these creatures reached a height of a hundred feet, but as the intelligence increased, the bodies grew smaller. A concrete example of that can be seen in the animals. Today, they are small, but they are descended of gigantic creatures. 44. They built great images of nine yatis high, the size of their bodies. Inner fires had destroyed the land of their fathers. The water threatened the fourth. Paul says a yatis is a measurement said to be corresponded to our yard. The Lemurian year world was destroyed largely by volcanic eruptions, and now because of their degeneracy and crystallization, the Atlantean world was threatened by water. 45. The first waters came. They swallowed the seven great islands. Paul says the floods that destroyed the great Atlantean world are here described. They destroyed the seven sacred centers around which the Atlantean world was built. The last to go was a great island in the Atlantic Ocean, which in sinking carried with it 60 million people. 46. All holy saved, the unholy destroyed, with them most of the huge animals produced from the sweat of the earth. 
that which was good was led out of Atlantis, while that which was unholy was destroyed. The sacred wisdom was carried into Egypt and into India, Hall says. The sinking of Atlantis is the origin of the story of the flood. At this time, most of the prehistoric animals that had survived the Lemurian cataclysms vanished from the face of the earth. The ancient wisdom with its priests was spared, but the Atlantean Empire, which had become wicked beyond all hope, was practically destroyed. Stanza 12. Few men remained, some yellow, some brown and black, and some red and remained. The moon colored were gone forever. The race was not entirely destroyed, Hall says. However, some of the yellow, some of the brown, some of the black, and some of the red remained. The very early races, however, entirely vanished. 48. The fifth produced from the holy stock remained. It was ruled by, over by the first of the divine kings. 49. Who redescended? Who made peace with the fifth? Who taught and instructed it? These are the serpents, divine kings, who redescended from the heavens to make ready the bodies of another great race of creatures who incarnated into our people. These were largely the initiates, the serpents who had been developed by the previous races and are demigods of mythology. Such is the history of the universe. So, a lot of this is incredibly interesting. A lot of it's very hard for me to understand. We get a history of the earth, we get an idea that the Lumurians came first and they experimented with many bodies, but they didn't choose a lot of, there was a lot of mindless bodies and experimentation on the, on the planet. We get a lot of discussion about the way that the earth formed and the idea of the absolute, which is very interesting. But again, the only thing that rubs me wrong about this material is it's possibility to be used for racist purposes in an implication that certain races uh, there's even a couple things I didn't read here. Um, so, but the very important thing to know is that, that occult schools and mystery schools and secret societies have looked at this material as an essential secret fact. And some of this information is used and is a, is a basis for many belief systems. It does have rev resonance with the law of one material as well as Dion Fortune's discussions of the Logos. And so I've seen some corroboration of these, inf these descriptions. Uh, there's a lot to it, and the book of Gion is very fascinating. And Manly P. Hall does an amazing job of interpreting these things and these stanzas. So I don't know if you've ever even heard of the book of Gion, but these are the stanzas, and these are the interpretations by Manly P. Hall. And honestly, I'm... I don't know what to think. There's so much information here. There's so many different things. Uh, it's an amazing bit of information. I wonder how much of it is true or just a, a very vivid imagination, uh, a writer by H.P. Blavatsky. And there's really no way for us to ever know. But it's just interesting how we see correspondences in other sectors that are describing the same things. That is what I find interesting. And there's always this mystery about uh, early Tibet as if there's a sort of secret knowledge that is carried there. And that is coming from this a little bit. And I'm just somebody that's interested in secret knowledge, even if it's not real. If there are occult schools that have secret knowledge, then I, I want to read it. Uh, some magic schools and occult texts are completely impossible to understand including the secret doctrine, you can see how some of these quotations are just utterly ridiculous. Manly P. Hall is the one that's unlocking some of this, and I found it interesting, and at least I can say I kind of understand it. I don't know how important it is. It's important to you if it gives light to something that you want understanding of about the universe. So, in any case, I hope that you enjoyed that. That was a lot of confusing information, and I might have to go back and listen to it myself to better understand some of this stuff. It was uh, hard for me to understand parts of it. It still is hard, but man, oh man, I understand it way more until I had not heard of Manly P. Hall's discussion of this. So it's very helpful, and we will be reading more Manly P. Hall in other areas. He was a terrific lecturer on the same level as... Neville Goddard and many others. 
In this, he has a, a treasure trove of non-copyrighted lectures that we can talk about that are very interesting. And we will continue to expand on this stuff with our interviews and discussion materials and lectures. We will have many interesting episodes in the future. It's interesting. I kept on thinking of a passage from the Dolores Cannon books in The Custodians where she talks about the archaics which I might to de dedicate an episode to a future time, how, how the archaics are the ones that created the solar system. And so it's kind of implied here. Maybe that's what happened. Who knows? But in any case, thank you for spending this time and sticking all the way to the end here. I greatly appreciate it. Tell me what you think about this stuff. Is it just a fable or a long, bizarre rant by a woman from long ago? Who knows? but I'd love to hear your comments on it. I love all of you and imagining the best for you. All episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.